Today I'd like to, to uh, talk about a, a topic that was actually requested in a student question at one point, and I, I promised to give it. This is one of these modules that I often give as part of this course. Um, and this time, rather than having a guest lecture, I, I did want to have, uh, have some coverage of this. This has to do with requirements. requirements. Elicitation. Okay. Um, and I'm going to hit on this material pretty quickly. Um, this could be two lectures, but I really want to drive home some very practical points that you can use with your stakeholders, including myself, but also Mike at, at Luxonic or others that you deal with there. So, the, what is a requirement? Well, tell me, what is a requirement? What's the software requirement? Just roughly. Okay, so, so that's an element of it, some amount of, of business logic needed, I use that word advisedly, to solve the problem. Clinton, is it? Yes. yes. Um, to, to solve a problem. Um, and there's a couple of key words. We want to refine it a little bit, uh, but it's a couple of key words. It's a criteria that has to be satisfied. So it's a, it's a criteria. It's needed to have a successful project. Um, and uh, it, it has to do with, as Clemson said, in solving problems, things that are needed. And requirements gathering has been described by Jerry Weinberg, who's, who's sort of a leading thinker in this area, has contributed some really thoughtful books, as an attempt to discover what product is desired by people. Okay? So there's some stakeholders, what do they want for this to be a successful project? That's so how I often begin projects. What would it mean for this project for you for it to be successful? So why am I going to give this lecture? Because you'll need to elicit these requirements and because it's oddly hard to elicit requirements well and it's extremely important. And I should add here, with a few tips, it can be a lot less error prone, a lot less problematic. By, by having some of the pointers that I'm going to be providing you you have less risk of missing big issues that are going to impact your software development and make it, and that will, by applying these, you'll be able to lower your, your chance of, uh, of having big problems arise from missing or misunderstood requirements. Okay? So I'm going to motivate it just a little bit. That could be, again, a whole lecture. Requirements gathering is arguably the single most important thing in software. I say arguably because I think there's some other components that are also extremely important, but it's certainly one of the very top. And it's one of the top reasons for failure in software development, that a project doesn't meet success. I'm going to focus most of my attention today in providing tips to, to elicit things more reliably, lessening ambiguity, avoiding missing requirements, um, and, uh, and then helping to, to lower the risk of requirements changes. So I mentioned, look, I mean, requirements are, are the number one or number two reason for historically having runaway projects, projects which don't complete in time, which go way over time over budget. There were early versions of this class where I, I would have the students read, read count, uh, <coughs> recountings of software project disasters. And it's a really interesting literature for those who are, who are interested in learning from experience of others. There's some projects which you know, ended up with 10 times the budget as originally anticipated, or it was estimated to take you know, six months, and it took four years, or what have you. And there's some very famous cases of this. Um, and one of the foremost reasons, probably the number one or number two reason is a, a problems with, with requirements and unstable requirements. Another thing is that requirements, problems, multiply over time. And this is, this is something you may well be asked in the exam. If you identify problems earlier in software development, you tend to benefit. So if there's a problem that originates if this is time here, 
and this is dollars or amount of work that that results from finding a problem um, at different stages. Let's suppose a problem creeps in early, but we only find it, we only identify it at this stage or that stage or that stage or that stage successively later. How do you think, do you think the amount of dollars spent or dollars wasted, we could think of it, goes up or down? If a problem is introduced very early, let's say at a requirement, and it takes longer to, to find it, have we lost more money or less money than if we find it early? Do we save money if we find it early or late? Early. Yeah, early. And it turns out that if you graph this out, do you think it goes up linearly? No, it goes up ex exponentially, it turns out. This is like release of the product or something like that. It becomes a lot more painful to debug or to fix when it's released. I'm not sure if you have an embedded system that's in thousands of cars worldwide and you have to fix a bug um, in it. So if you find problems in the requirements space, it's vastly cheaper than if you find them later. Okay. So, so this is a graph of sort of how much it costs to find a problem that originates early only in a later phase. Why is that? Why does it go up so fast? <coughs> Why does it go up exponentially like that? What, at a very concrete level, what's happening? As longer time goes on, um, if I consider longer and longer time to find it, what's, what's happened along the way that's cost money? Yeah. You build more so, system around uh, yeah. something that you assume is right that you find. You, precisely. You built your system around this thing. What, what, Let's be more concrete than that, even. Um, when you say build a system around it, what, what does that involve? Okay, writing code is what we think about. But what else besides, is there besides writing code? Yeah. Testing, validation. Testing, so we write all these test scripts associated with it. You do test plans involving it, other things. Yeah. Uh, or design. Design. Okay, uh, that's exactly right. Mason? He may not think it's a big achievement, but um, for some of the small things may be different. Okay. Um, so yeah, we build a whole design, a technical design around it. And suddenly, now our technical design has to take into account a new requirement, which then changes the design, makes it more complicated, and that ripples through to, to elements of detailed design planning, these software interfaces we put into place, and then to the details of the code, and then when the code changes, what often has to change with it? The testing, has to, that tests that code, and, and you know our test plans have to change, and the flow through the system changes, which changes our, our sort of um, test uh, needs through it, and we have, to, we have to update our build scripts, take into account new technologies. It, it just compounds the longer, longer it is. And in fact, there have been some very interesting studies done of asking teams to build a system, um, build a system with requirements, you know, not really that clear, okay, um, versus asking them to rebuild them once all the, the, uh, the, the requirements are really, really pinned down. And the amazing thing is it's different by orders of magnitude. If you have agreement, I want you to do exactly this. Imagine you had a, a copy of the system that someone else built, but for some reason that code base has to be jettisoned. Maybe it's issues with, uh, you know, it's in a, the wrong language, or it's, in, uh, it's now got some legal encumbrances. All I want to do is copy exactly what the appearance is in the flow. Turns out that's much easier. <laughs> You just study it and you say, okay, we need this to do this and this to do that. And there's not this kind of back and forth with the stakeholder. So it turns out requirements affect delivery speed, product quality, and, and, and the cost of a product. Does anyone recognize this? What is this thing? It's a range. It's the, it's that triangle. yeah, it's the iron triangle, okay? And it turns out that 
If you got your requirements wrong, it affects each of these things. Why product quality? If you're a stakeholder, why does it affect product quality? I'm a stakeholder. I'm a stakeholder, right? <laughs> Tell me I'm a stakeholder, right? Um, I'm a stakeholder. Why does having requirements off affect my sense of product quality? Yeah. Because the requirements should directly reflect what the product is. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, you may build the system right, but you haven't built the right system, right? You give me, you give me something, a system that isn't the one I wanted. Thank you very much. These are not the droids I'm looking for, right? And you're looking for. Um, uh, so it affects quality. Why does it affect the economy? Because if you have a big misunderstanding and it takes a while, like if you hand it to me an ID5 and I say, that's not what I was looking for, guess what? Well, okay, it's not going to be for ID5. You folks will be free. Um, but, but you have to go back and rework it, right? You have to go through rework. You have to throw away code and put in place new code. So it takes extra time and it drags out the time, right? It drags out the time. So, you know, it, it affects all of these things and, and through multiple pathways. As we say, multiple generative pathways here. It affects, it affects things through, you know, development effective list. There's churn and people say, oh, now I have to fix this. But there's parts of the code base that make the old assumptions still, and I, I update the code base, but I miss some things, and it leads to, to problems um, adapting it, etc. So it turns out good requirements help along a lot of different, lot of different areas. Lower project risk, you say, you know, lower risk, you, the rug will be yanked out from under you. You say, oh, that's what you mean? Oh, man, we, we implemented it differently. Um, faults are caught earlier, you know, you have faster development because people are being held up to know what the expectations are. Um, you know, there's elimination of unnecessary development. And for real world projects, less chance that a project will be canceled. Don't worry, I won't cancel your project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this project is defunct. Don't worry. Um, but in real world, Things that are going off the tracks get canceled, right? Um, uh, this can also help document change needs, et cetera. Okay, let's talk about some problems with requirement statements. Suppose you have a thing that tries to list the requirements for a system. I mean, I gave you as a stakeholder, I gave you a document, right? What, what, could, what could go wrong with that document? A document that purports to list the uh, requirements for a system. Mm, well. Depending on who wrote it, sometimes they might not understand technically what they actually yeah. want. That's right. So that's right. They, they, they may not have a clear idea in mind of what the technical <laughs> options even are, much less exactly which one they, they want. And so it may be articulated kind of a fuzzy way. This is one of the reasons why. Actually, you folks are really lucky for both these projects to be working with people who are either developers or, you know, constantly working with developers because it makes sure there's less risk of communication there. A lot of teams in this class have worked with others who are not from development background. What other things could go wrong? Particularly if you have someone who's not a technical person, not a software developer, not a computer scientist, what could go wrong? Yeah. That's right. So they say, you know, I want a system that will work offline and and get updates when any software developer or when, when any updates occur to the database. And you say, well, if it's offline, it can't get those updates, but that's not necessarily clear to them, right? Um, or they'll say, you know, it should be it should be online all the time, even though it's mounted in a car. And you say, okay, that's pretty hard to ensure if you're in a tunnel, you know, a tunnel of, uh, uh, under the English Channel, getting complete connectivity is pretty, you know, constant connectivity is pretty difficult. So sometimes there's a lack of understanding of, of what's feasible, okay? Other things? By the way, sometimes that occurs to technical, um, really quite technical topics like 
you know, they assume you can consider an exhaustive match between hundreds of people and do that more or less instantly. And I'm not going to be able to consider an exhaustive match within those time frames with existing architectures. Mason, did you want to say something else? I'll just get my bit. Yeah, yeah, too, too ambitious. Good. What other things? Suppose you're dealing with a, a doctor or you're dealing with a lawyer or you're dealing with someone who does dental, dental, you know, they're, they're a dentist or, or they're a uh, accountant. Yeah, Matthew. They don't know what they want. Yeah, so th they don't know what they want. It's kind of similar. Will? That's right, because you don't understand their needs. You don't understand their language. They say, you know, I wanted to distinguish between um, lingual and buccal, um, you know, cavitation and and uh, caries caries classifications, um, and you know, an individual's dental history, oral health history. Well, that means an enormous amount to any dentist, but to you, it's not clear. What does that really mean? And often they're speaking in a different language of sorts. It's, they have these concepts which you don't necessarily have. You have ambiguity. There's a lot of other ones too. Conflict between different stakeholders. Uh, yeah, Lisa. Um, sometimes they'll ask for something that they don't really understand, they don't want. Yes. notifications are the proper way to do notifications on iPhone is X. And traditionally, these have been addressed by different sets of developers. And you know, the folks in the Android world may be very sophisticated Android developers, but they're not going to know the right way, you know, the accepted way to do this on iPhone, and vice versa, vice versa. So if you have you know, an iPhone developer who just designs an Android system, you might get something that looks very, it behaves very strangely and it looks weird from the perspective of the Android, the Android user, right? Um, be kind of like cloning a Mac, a Mac application to look exactly like that on a Windows box or a Linux box. It would look kind of, it, it, it just doesn't look right. So Mesa, uh, so Mesa is exactly, um, exactly on track there. So there's some other things too. I mean, look, uh, if we gather understanding from the stakeholders, sometimes we, we forget you know, exactly what they told us. Um, we, we make mistakes when they're pointing out something as to what exactly they mean. Yes, they can be unnecessarily specific uh, about, about how they want us to do this. And really what they want is, look, just do it the right way on iPhone. But they don't know the right way. Right? Um, uh, I will also mention, sometimes developers, this happens a lot, developers have their pet ideas of what it should be, and they try to get their ideas in there. It's like, you really want this. I think you really want that. Wouldn't it be cool if you could do this? And that's not always bad, because often that means something they can do easily, and would, they think it will be an asset, but sometimes it's not an asset from the perspective of the stakeholder. So I want to distinguish here between functional requirements, which are requirements dictated to the behavior of the software, 
the functionality of their software, the features that it offers, right? Um, and, um, and non-functional requirements. Which of these do you think stakeholders, if, if they're not particularly from computer science background, they don't have software development background, which of these is easier for them to keep in mind? Which are the ones when they say, I want to tell you what the system should do, which do they have in mind? The things about features or the things about non-functional requirements? Things like uh, reliability, security, availability, uh, usability. Which do you think they have in mind for? Functionality, yes. Kind of the, the features. And often it's kind of a narrow functionality, right? They say, look, I'm on a system that will do this sort of thing. You know, it'll be a, an app for for people, for, for parents with young children to help them understand the, the needs for their young children to get uh, immunized and, and to go in for well baby visits and uh, to have proper nutrition at different stages of the child's development. And what they're thinking about is the app. That's what's on their mind, the app. But often what they need to be thinking about is are things like the administrative interface of the app. How are you going to update the app with new tips as new health information comes out? Or, or how are you going to store the information that's on a phone, on a server, so that if someone switches devices, they're still going to have access to their information? They're thinking about the things right in front of them, the, the user experience, perhaps, with the app. So most requirements are actually not directly from the customer. They're not customer requirements. They're not things that the client, the customer, lays down, okay? Um, often, there are these things called derived requirements, or I'll call them here informally implied requirements, that, that fall out given the current state of technology. So, you know, someone says, look, um, you know, this thing needs to run on Oculus, and this data visualization tool has to run on Oculus. Um, well, okay, that implies a, a certain maximum scalability is the number of data points that can be looked at without feeling seasick. Um, uh, or, you know, this thing has to run on a, a, a mobile device. Um, well, okay, it implies something that needs to have low power consumption or else it's going to drive the battery of the device. You know, uh, very low, it, will probably, it may get killed by the operating system. They'll be warned this is taking undue power, right? Um, uh, maybe it needs to run in real time, and that means it really needs to run on, on GPUs or FPGAs. Um, this was an earlier one, uh, an earlier era. Jason, fortunately, is, uh, is, is found out that FPGAs these days have some support for floating point. But in earlier days, you really had to live with fixed point. Um, and so, look, if you need field programmable systems, you're going to do it with FPGAs, and therefore you have to use fixed point at that time, right? Um, so there's all these things that are technical requirements, and the stakeholder who gives you the customer requirements, they don't necessarily know what this means. They don't know what a GPU is or you know, what it means to have a rendering pipeline on the GPU. They don't understand you know, power, power consumption and what it means to be, uh, you know, to have something that's lower power consumption, what that means in terms of its design under a, a phone. All they want is a system will run on the phone and do this job. And you have to figure out what does that mean and what, what does that rule out as a solution? What does it rule in? What does it mean as infeasible? Um, and you know, there's a, there's a real challenge here because on both sides often, the, the client or the customer and on the part of the technical team, there's, there's unique things that each of them knows that it's hard for them to communicate with the other. Often the client here, it's not that the clients are just non-technical and don't know anything and they have to be guided by the technical team. No, often they know a lot about their field. It's just they can't, they're not tech folks who spend their lives immersed in tech. You know, as Mesa said, they may not know 
what the accepted way of doing things are now for you know user experience on a website. So they can't quite envision their solution exactly. They're not immersed in that tech, uh, technical domain. We spend most of our lives with technology. You know, many times a day we're just immersed in one technology or another. Um, often these stakeholders are not so immersed they know exactly what they, they want. Um, we're used to thinking in these terms about what the pieces would be, they're not. They have a very hard time often communicating required understanding. They're gonna talk with you in dense jargon of their area. So accounting, they're gonna be talking with you about double entry bookkeeping and ledgers and accounts receivable and accounts payable. And you're gonna say, yeah, I don't know what you mean by that. You know, I don't know what that means. Or a dentist will talk to you about, you know, um, the, the details of, of dental health and you're not gonna know those terms or how you, how you capture that data, what are the, the choices for, for you know, the location of a, of a carry on the tooth or what have you. Um, client is not going to be able to know typically what's feasible for a product uh, or the logical steps that must be undertaken to solve it. Um, and they're not going to understand the technical implications of those steps. So the client is often at disadvantage in certain areas but has deep deep understanding in certain areas that they can't communicate easily. The technical team typically can't directly understand the domain specific need. Like, they want to build a system for dentists, but what does that mean? You know, what is it, what is, what is it that's needed exactly is not clear to them. Um, and they can't appreciate this gap between what is there now and what is sought, because they don't know what the systems are right now, and they have a dim understanding of what's sought. They can't clearly envision the solution either, yet, because they don't know what, what is that's needed, and they can't readily parse this domain language that's being thrown at them. They don't know what exactly is mean being meant by these terms. And I want to highlight the fact that often clients will use terms in very specific ways. They'll be very specific about the term. And for you, it may just be a generic term, but for them, it means something very, very, very specific that is specific to their field. And it won't be clear to you what exactly it means. Okay? Um, uh, there's, there's many such terms that, that we encounter. Uh, if you were to work in the infectious disease areas, um, you're a software person, you might talk about system prevalence centers. They're called STIs. I can assure you, if you talk with infectious disease physicians about STIs, they will have a very different idea in mind. If you talk about, and so there are sites that are called aggregator sites online. Aggregators, you know, pull together information from many other sites and sort of often in a in a sort of dashboard or some sort of way, aggregate it together. Um, we have ways of computer scientists about talking about aggregation of data or content. Uh, for others, aggregates are associated with prison sentences that offenders are undergo in response to corrections having been convicted in a court of law. So aggregates for criminal justice people mean something very different. Um, and if you say, if they say, I'm going to give you aggregate data, the aggregates data, it doesn't mean it's summarized and is sort of added together or something. It means it's like data about people and corrections. So these common words that we use in one area mean something totally different in other areas. And they often mean something very, very, very specific. Um, I find myself, I do a lot of work across disciplinary boundaries, and I run into these things all the time. And I have to be very careful who I'm talking with to know what word to use. So let's talk about each of these categories. So functional requirements. This is a template for writing functional requirements. Who shall be able to do what? Sometimes to what, to, to what thing. Often there's some qualifier associated with it, having to do with how soon or the quality with which, uh, and, and then 
actually specify use cases. Um, and from a, a systems perspective, it may specify conditions under which something happens, what is done, what is done, or, or qualifiers associated with how soon. Here's a few example functional requirements. Okay. Uh, all network transmitted data that includes health information shall be encrypted using 128-bit RSA encryption. Okay. Um, so here, network transmitted data shall be <coughs> encrypted with this qualifier of 128-bit RSA encryption. Um, until the camera app is either closed by the user or experiences a timeout due to inactivity, the take photo button on the main IFP screen shall remain disabled. Okay? Um, so this is telling you something about a state that the system is in, is in where the camera app is open and the button that says normally says take photo is disabled because the photo is already in a state of being taken. Okay? I can go through these. But the point is these are written in a very specific way that, that broadly matches these sort of, of criteria, either from a system's perspective or a user's perspective. You know, uh, here, a user indicates a search term to the search engine. The software responds by displaying a list of pages that match the criteria. The list is, uh, is limited to 100 results. The user may indicate the next 100 results are to be displayed, in which case the system displays those results instead. I want to draw your attention to something with this last one. And it's actually true for, for a number of these others. Uh, <coughs> so what does this not specify? So, so, for example, may indicate the next 100 results are to be displayed. To really turn that into a specific design, what would I need to do further? Yeah. Oh, okay. For one, there's no specification of ordering of the results. There's no right. specification Good. of how they might indicate that, whether it's buttons, pagination. That's right. Is it a link that they click to get to the next 100? Is it a button? You know, is it... Um, with a special key that they push, what well, you know, this is deliberately written in a somewhat abstract way, and I say deliberately because it's designed to not pin it down fully. Now, Mesa mentioned, you know, very importantly, this list of pages that match the criteria that might usefully be listed in a le in a ordering of decreasing match or significance, and that's very important. But this is also written at a, fair, at a high enough level that you have some latitude in, in, in how you want to, uh, to specific, specifically take it forward. Did you folks get exposed to use cases in 270? Okay, so you're familiar with, with the use cases. It's a very common way of illustrating functional requirements. It does not completely specify. Um, but it can be understood by many users, and it can work well in cases where there's considerable in, in, in involvement by the user. Um, and it can let you think about things that can't be captured um, really, really uh, that well. It sort of tells the story about how the user interacts with this. And often it's, it's, um, it's rolled up before formal functional requirements. The problem is there's some shortcomings um, of them. Because of time, I'm not going to go into these in more detail. But some of them have to do with like technical detail, the nature of the algorithm, for example. But they're a good start. And I'd be delighted to see use cases associated with uh, features or functionality associated with your projects. Hmm? Um, but I want to spend a bit of time talking about non functional these are the sphere where we as computer scientists, and more specifically as software developers, need to step up. They have to do with things that aren't in, often aren't in the user's mind explicitly, but they may have tacit, tacit assumptions about them. Examples would be performance or memory footprint. 
the reliability of the system or the availability of it or portability of it. You know, the, the robustness to error, like a network disconnection or the scalability of the system. They are often not going to tell you what the needs are here, but often they are tacit or they are implicit in their descriptions. What do I mean by that? Let's take performance as an example. What do I mean by it's often implicit in the user's request? How could the user, yeah, yeah, um, Evan? Yeah, they're just going to assume that it, it is actually not so slow that they can actually use it on some level. Yeah. Like everybody does it in software. That, that's right. And, and that's not to say that they necessarily could tell you it's got to respond in 100 milliseconds, but they might have in mind some <coughs> criteria that it's not obviously a nuisance or it's not painful, right? It's not, it's not going to be a pain to do, right? I, I push this button and I have to go get a, you know, go, go get a coffee while I'm waiting for it or something. So often they'll have some implicit kind of thing they're counting on there. Um, let's suppose we talk about um, scalability. What, what assumption might they have there? Okay, so they want a system to allow people to report, you know, geomarked occurrences of interest according to time and the nature of it, along with photos of it so that people could see it in the map. And they want to allow communities to form around this. What, what assumptions might they have about scalability? Yeah? I, well, in this case, you might not know like, what even their marketing strategy is. What if they just roll out a huge ad campaign and your servers just yeah. like? Totally. Yeah, so often, often people are not from computer science or, or you know, computational background, will not know that scalability is even an issue. It's like, well, of course it should be able to handle hundreds of thousands of users. <coughs> um, and they may not have thought to, to mention it, right? Um, usability is another, another one. So often they'll try to for that reliability, right? Okay, is this a zero nines application where 99.9999, you know, a, a, a six nines, 99.9999999 a percent of the time it should be up? Uh, or could this be down every night as a system? You know, these are, these are things they're not going to often, often mention, okay? Um, so there may be, for example, performance-wise, real-time guarantees that they want to provide. The system needs to be able to, to keep up with incoming data uh, in a live way or a certain response time. What do I mean by throughput of a system? We often distinguish between latency and throughput. Anyone get exposed to that in another class? Yeah. Brandon. Yeah. Yeah, so it does have to do with bandwidth. And so we talk about the throughput of a connection. <coughs> but more generally, when we have a system that is processing not just data often, but tasks, like it has to do a certain number of things. Um, Maybe it's, um, you know, uh, perform a certain number of bookings of airline flights as requested by users. It has to be able to handle a certain number per unit time. So maybe it's, you know, this system has to have a performance of making 100,000 airline, 100, airline reservations per hour or something like that. And we can talk about throughput of a connection, how many bytes per hour or bytes per second can it handle. Uh, bits per second, but um, often with throughput, we're dealing with tasks to be accomplished, um, uh, the number of, of transactions to be handled, for example. Latency has to do with, for a given transaction from its start to its stop, how long does it take? It's a responsiveness issue often. You know, How quickly does it respond in a way that it completes that task? These are things that are Look, I'm explaining this to you as computer scientists because these are actually very important computer science criteria by which we judge system performance. But the chance that you will stumble on a stakeholder not from computer science background who knows these terms is very small. You have to bring them to the table 
and make sure that their expectations are met. Because they may have expectations. They just don't know to articulate them, right? Um, and they may have, there may be some sort of maintainability uh, requirements, too. Um, this may sound obvious to you, and times are changing, but let's suppose you have a stakeholder and you really want to build a smartphone app. A smartphone app for, you know, to, to, so that um, you know, women can, who are, who are during their pregnancies, they can get appropriate nutrition information and information on, on uh, classes uh, and information on um, foods to eat, uh, but uh, on exercise and, uh, and medicines, etc. Um, supplements like folic acid. Uh, suppose you have a system like that. They would say, I want you to build this for smartphones. They may not know that, wait a minute, traditionally Android development and iPhone development are different. And if you have to build it for smartphones, which system are you talking about? Because each of them needs a separate code base traditionally. They're not going to know that particularly. It's so, just, well, build it for smartphones. Um, I, I guess it means build it for both, but you're saying I can't have the same developer build it for both. Now, this is changing with Flutter and changing with. Uh, with React Native and so on, but um, but it's still an issue. And again, stakeholders won't won't know these things. Okay, so indirect requirements are often um, very important. I want to talk about some tips. These are very concrete tips. I want you to think about the past few slides should have given you some things to talk about. You know, asking the user about performance, ask thinking about these things, and asking what their expectations are. Very important, but. I want to talk about other tips. Look, you're gathering information from a stakeholder. Often that stakeholder is an expert in the area. You're an expert in software development. There needs to be this communication. If you are gathering requirements for their system, it often requires expertise in the area. And so often you're at somewhat of a disadvantage. You want to know what they want the system to do. One way that can help here is repeat understanding of the requirements of the stakeholder. You think you understood what they were asking? Say it back to them. Say it back to them. Say, I think I heard you say this. Is that what you mean? Before you write it down. Or you, know, you write it down first and then you say, I think this is what you said. Did I get it right? That is really useful because now it's gone wrong trip from their head to yours and back. And if they say, yep, that's what I mean. You've probably gotten communication. Now, it's possible you'll be parroting their words back to them that they're meaning this word in one way and you're meaning it in another way and you still don't recognize it, but it lowers the chance. Maybe you ask the stakeholder to repeat the requirement in different words, in words that are less technical from their domain. So they say, you know, I want, I want this system to record mandibular and, and uh, and uh, uh, maxillary uh, carries as to carry location. And you say, okay, um, could you repeat that back to me in, in different words that, are, that maybe you'll be more familiar in, in lay terms? And they can unpack it. I want it to record cavities which are in the jaw and, and the teeth, you know, not in the jaw, but on the upper part of the mouth with respect to one of five locations of where cavities can be. Okay, now we're starting to get a better idea where these you know, problems <coughs> are. Um, requirements documents should be updated over time. They're, they should be living documents. They're not things you gather once and just leave. You might update them as you talk with the stakeholder more and they emphasize things. Um, try to figure out where these things sit for. For after all, the requirement may be may feed into elements of design, have tests that are testing that it's met, have code associated with it. And if you capture the linkages between the requirements and these things, if a requirement changes or is axed, you know which things aren't needed or have to change in the code. Prioritize requirements. Ask the stakeholder, which of these requirements is most important? If you can have any of these things you've asked for, which of them should I focus on first? That's a really good thing to, to emphasize, to, to get guidance on what's, what's, what might you do first. Um, 
You might structure some acceptance tests around requirements. Imagine a performance requirement, right? The system has to respond within a minute's time in this task. That would be something quite easy to have an acceptance test. Scalability, right? You do a, a, a test associated with scalability, a load, a load test, where you, you have 100 people simulated as being on the system concurrently, and you see if the system slows to a crawl. Um, latency is another thing. But you could have acceptance tests around, you know, you undertake this action on the system and you verify this occurs. Um, think about hidden requirements. What are things that they're not saying? Um, let's just see, uh, pretty the important ones. There's some things about splitting up things. Oh, ambiguous words. Try to explain things in lay terms because words that are used in a specialized way in computer science won't be obvious to the stakeholder. They won't recognize the mistake. And things that are technical <coughs> terms from their area often won't be clear to you. So you want to unpack, uh, unpack things. And particularly watch out for ambiguity. You know, um, you say, the system may do this. OK, does that mean it might or might not do it? Um, if, if, and under what conditions might it do it? Um, it'll do it fast. What does fast mean? You know, it'll be robust, OK? Can we get more specificity about this? It'll handle many users. What does many mean for your system? Is, is many users for a collaborative interface around a system five users? Is it 10? Is it 500? Is it 50,000 that need to use it? That will make a huge difference for whether it's even feasible and, and how, to, how to put it into place. OK, let's talk about some sources of errors here. Missed ambiguity, OK? Um, uh, so maybe you're interviewing a client um, about their needs. And um, they use certain words, but they weren't unpacked. And the reviewer, or the, the person doing the interview, the technical person, jumps to some conclusion about what they mean. But in fact, it remains ambiguous. Um, and uh, here, uh, a good example is actually may not. The system may not do this. Give me two meanings. If I say, under this condition, <coughs> under this condition the system may not, um, you know, uh, may not execute the query. Give me two interpretations of that. Yes, one, same. Oh, absolutely never. Uh, one is, yeah, it, it's illegal for it to do so. It, or it's, it's, be careful, with a police officer or with a, with a justice uh, in a courtroom, illegal is not a good term to use. You know, it's impermissible. It's not allowed for it to do that. So it's ruled out. It is forbidden for it to do that. Okay, that's one reason you say it may not do this. Uh, what's another way of interpreting it? The other one is it could do it and it could not. Yeah, it could or could not do it. It's up to, you know, maybe up to you whether it does it or not. That's fine. Which does that mean? <laughs> it may, may be pretty important. Um, I'll tell you another thing that's really a very common problem, a missing requirement. A requirement that's just missing. It's absent. Um, and the problem here is that this can require, um, a requirement that's not stated can mean very different things. It can occur, the miss, uh, an requirement can be missing under very different circumstances. One circumstance is the users don't care a bit about it. They don't care about it. It's, it's missing because they don't give a damn. Forgive my language. They, they just don't care about this issue. What's another reason? It's so obvious to them, of course it has to do it, that they don't even mention it. Because of course they assume you know a car has to move on a road. What else is a car for? You know, um, they care, may care strongly about it and assume that the dental staff are of course aware of it. Um, you know, a dental system has to be able to be up it has to be able to be updated when a new dental appointment occurs. Oh. Of course. Or 
teeth get pulled. <coughs> of course, teeth or teeth aren't the same between people. Oh, I know that. Um, and and as a dentist, they might think that any software developer knows that different that kids have different sets of teeth than adults, or that that adults over time their dentition changes. Molars may come in, you know, at certain ages. Maybe they assume, well, of course you're going to know, know that. Of course it needs that flexibility. And you know, maybe they forget to, to think about the issue. Um, at all, maybe they care about it, they just don't think about it. So a missing requirement, something that's not there, is ironically sometimes one of the most deadly things. They have a strong assumption about they don't. they just think it's so obvious they don't even mention it. Give me something that a user might think is really so obvious they're not going to mention it. With, let's suppose it's a site that they're, a community site they're putting up. They want you to build a community site for people who are, you know, scientists in a certain area. Um, what might be some things they don't even mention? Because of course it needs to be true. How about if it's a, it's a site people log into and post things and, and share things, etc. What what are some things they might reasonably assume? Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, Say. Good. I very, love it. It's very deeply related to like the whole searching thing because yeah. uh, you know, if a user ends up bookmarking a page, what if you're doing say post or get request to get your next page? Yep. It's depending on whether the URL will stay there. Exactly. Or will be consistent to, to yeah, is this URL going to consistently get you back to the same site? So I, I like it. It's the same location in the site, the same content. This is an important, important thing. How about non functional requirements also? Security, right? It should be a secure site. What does that mean? That it be secure? Okay, password protected. Okay. Um, should there be a certain level of insurance of you know strength of, of passwords? What if people uh, forget their passwords? Should they be able to restore them? How about scalability, right? Um, uh, you know, well, of course, there's millions of people who would be using this versus, no, this is a community of 500. You know, these things have very different implications. Um, so missing requirements are, are quite important. Um, observation knowledge. If someone misheard the statement from the, the person who heard the gathering, how can you buffer against observational error? Okay, so your team is interviewing the stakeholder, the client. What can you do? help lower the chance that observation and error will lead to an error in your understanding of the requirements. Yes? Both of those are very good. And at a very simple level, was there another hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Then uh, re right. of your app. Yeah, ask, ask back. Uh, yeah, Kareem. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what I was, I uh, had four months in mind. Have multiple people there. Because look, if one person misses it or interprets it in an off base way, at least you've got others who might be able to check that, right? Um, uh, maybe one of them could say, I thought I heard this. The other said, I thought I heard that instead. You know, what was it? So getting this back and forth with the user or with multiple people is really, really helpful. Recall error can also be helped by having multiple sets of eyes or ears there, okay? Um, other sorts of errors, well, I said this earlier. Completely neglect tacit requirements in these areas. A user often will not think about these areas. They won't think about the security or the maintainability, the operability of the site or the performance of the site or integration with the existing systems or how to bring the data from their existing system to this. They might not think about the needs for whole categories of users. How are they going to be administering this community site? How are they going to reset passwords for someone? You know, how are they going to put new content on for, for couples who have a young child to help them know about the 
location of well baby services or about you know the location of childcare uh, outfits in the city. Presumably there's a class of administrative users and who don't go through an app but go through a website and they're just not gonna think about this. Their, their notion is on the app. I want users to have an app. I want young family, you know, families to be able to have access to that. That's great. But what else is required? That's our job as computer scientists to help lead them through that. Um, and, and to help them understand, you know, okay, those apps that they have have to be connected at least some of the time. They can't store the data locally because if they need to switch phones to a new phone, they want to be able to get the app on that other phone that already has their information in it. Therefore, that information has to live on the server and therefore we need a server-side infrastructure to which their app has to connect on a periodic basis. And, you know, they're not going to know this. They just want that app in front of the person on an ongoing basis. And if you say that requires a server and you have to set up a server and have an administrative interface, they'll say, okay, okay? Then do what you have to do to make this app possible. This is a very rare phenomenon. I've been through it many times. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. Um, okay. Uh, we're coming up on 48 past. I, I will just note that there's a, there's a key um, step that is often required with, with uh, these requirements to, to elicit the requirements, gap, and sometimes said gather, but it's a more active process than just kind of gathering them in a passive way. You come up with requirements, you pass them back to the, to the client, the customer decides, is that okay? Then you have accepted requirements, and ideally you then build the system and use the system. But what often happens is what? Well, the requirements change. Why might the requirements change? I, I thought I might have a, a slide on it, but I, I don't hear. Why might requirements change over time? Well, Clinton said it earlier when his, some of his first comments. Business logic, business logic changes. Things change. You know, an organization merges with another one and how they do business changes. Uh, they make this, this group makes a strategic partnership and they bring all this new data to the, to the table. <coughs> Technology changes. Their sense of users' needs change. Competitors come out. Lots of different reasons that may shift their sense of what a desirable system is and leads to new needs for requirements. So over time, requirements evolve. And there's got to be some process for bringing these new requirements to the table. One of the ways of achieving that is the way that we're applying in this class. To wit, incremental development, this agile approach where periodically we reconvene with the stakeholders, as I'm asking you to do at least once a deliverable, and say, look, this is what we've got. What do you think of it? What's the next requirement or set of requirements you want in there? Is this what you have in mind? That makes it less likely that requirements errors will go missed for a long time by the stakeholder. It more, moreover helps alert you to changed requirements because all, you're always meeting with the stakeholder and they can always say, look, things are changing. I really think it'll be better to do this. And the truth, you know, to, to, to put in place this new requirement I didn't anticipate originally, or I'd like you to change how it does this because now we have recently some new needs have come to the fore from, from our, uh, our employees or what have you. And one of the long-standing truths that it took me years to really realize is often until users see a system, they actually encounter it, that often ends up clarifying their needs. And this is true for me as a very technical person. When I see an instantiation, an implementation of something I had in mind, it just brings up new ideas in my thinking about what the needs are. It makes me think, really need this, this is kind of clunky, or that's clunky.
close, but it, you know, it's, it's a bit off in this regard. Let's add this thing in. We like to think we can think way ahead and, and you know, design and envision a perfect system. Often it's not until we encounter it, we come face to face with an attempt to create parts of it, that's when our needs become clear. Okay? So when it comes to requirements, elicitation, Gathering those requirements becomes an ongoing process. This is not necessarily something you do now and you forever tell you know, Mike Wislowski to hold his peace. Or it's something you do for me and I say, this is my dream and you go off and build it. If, you know, um, uh, you know, things this is realized or not. Instead, it's an ongoing encounter and each incremental deliverable, you need to elicit more requirements. And you need to make sure that the ambiguities aren't getting there, things aren't missed, like security, performance, reliability, availability, et cetera. You need to be you know, disambiguating things, cross-checking things, uh, double-checking things, having multiple reviewers, repeating word, repeating understanding back to, to the stakeholder, et cetera. Okay? So that's what's required of you in an agile process. It's this ongoing elicitation of requirements that requires proactive um, minding by you throughout the development process. Okay? That is all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, I look forward to reviewing your deliverables and also to seeing your presentations, which I believe are due Tuesday. Right? Um, and uh, I will tell you, um, I'll work, work with uh, Dale to uh, find a time for our marketing session. And we'll alert each team so you can send us a couple representatives, okay? To, to clue us in on um, some aspects of your design that may not be, or aspects of your system that may not be obvious from the, from the hand in, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much.